Hello. Today we're going to be talking about imperialism in the period 1800 through 1914 CE. The process known as imperialism started much earlier than 1800 and lasted much further past 1914. This lecture will focus on that period, however. Let's start with an overview of the terms. I'd like to draw a distinction between imperialism and colonization. They are definitely related terms, but are different. Imperialism is about an empire. It's extending your country's political and economic power, either through diplomacy or military force, or more likely a combination of those two things. Whereas colonization is the establishment of control over a group of people or a geographic area, and that's to benefit the colonizers. So you can't really have colonies without engaging in a form of imperialism, but there were some imperial powers, like for example, the United States, that had fewer colonies. There were a number of reasons why nations engaged in colonization, and the first one is, is kind of the most important one, which is that countries or empires, they wanted to extend their power and their influence for a lot of reasons. Uh, one reason was competition for markets, and that's really the thing that drove the British Empire, uh, for example. But once the United States uh, became you know, an active player in imperialism and colonization, that made the competition even more severe. Another reason why uh, countries colonize is for uh, capital investments, um, having access to cheap labor, having access to raw materials. Uh, that's going to then create more profit for your country. Some countries were driven by religious conversion. They wanted to um, bring people into the fold. And for the most part, the people who were doing conversions were Christians. Uh, sometimes you just wanted to explore the unknown or the sense of what was unknown. And then the last one uh, was what is referred to as the white man's burden, which is uh, a, a, a term that describes social Darwinism. Social Darwinism is that idea that some people are uh, genetically inferior to other people. So taking the notion of Darwinism and survival of the fittest and then applying that to cultures and say and of course that is that exists to prop up Europeans and Americans uh, sense of their own superiority over other cultures. So here's a map of the world in about 1900 and it's color coded by uh, colonial power. So pink is the British Empire, and that's the most vast. Uh, the French are, for the most part, dominant in West Africa and in Southeast Asia. Uh, Spain, by 1900, had almost no colonies left. The Dutch only had the East Indies, and you can keep on going down the list there. The United States really only had uh, Cuba and the Philippines as true colonies in the way that the European powers had colonies. Uh, the Americans, of course, had immense influence in certain parts of the world, most notably the Americas. But you see there that by 1900, none or virtually none of, or, of the Spanish-speaking areas of the Americas were still colonies. They were all independent nations going all the way back into the 1810s and 20s. Continuing that thought, there were places around the world where colonization, European colonization, uh, was resisted. The Americas, again, partly because they had already achieved independence and partly because uh, the United States of America made very clear to Europe that they were to stay out of the Western Hemisphere, other than the places where they were already well-established, such as Canada. Uh, basically, the Western Hemisphere was going to be ours. There were a couple of places in Africa that resisted. One was Ethiopia. Ethiopia was 
uh, very hard for a European army to get to, and they were Christians. And the Europeans, even though it was a very different form of Christianity, uh, much harder for Europeans to justify colonizing Christians, even if they had different color skin. And then the only other place in Africa uh, that resisted colonization was Liberia. Liberia was a small nation in West Africa that was instituted by former slaves from the United States of America. So it was very closely aligned with the United States government and it was economically dependent upon the United States. So, you know, if a European country had tried to colonize Liberia, they would basically be taking on the United States of America, which by the late 19th century, no European power wanted to do. Um, and then in Asia, some places that resisted colonization, Japan, uh, but Japan had gone through this, this uh, moment in their history in the late 19th century where they adopted a lot of Western technologies um, to modernize their nation. And they were quite powerful by 1900 and more than able to, uh, to stand up to at least some of the European powers. Uh, the, another place was Thailand, which was known as Siam during this period, and you can see it in the map there. And Siam maintained, or Thailand maintained its independence because it was a buffer state between British India and Burma and uh, French Indochina. And so they were very successful at playing the British and the French off of each other. Um, they, you know, they were manipulated by both of those empires, but they were still able to maintain their independence throughout the period of colonization. So we're going to now look at this process of imperialism and colonization by looking uh, at the major colonizers. And not that surprising, the, the nation that we're going to start with first would be, would be the British, uh, the British Empire. It was the largest empire of all. We will begin our exploration of the British Empire by looking first at British Africa. The British had quite a lot of possessions in Africa by 1914. Uh, you can see they're in the dark blue. Uh, while they had a f only a couple of colonies in West Africa, it was some of the most uh, desirable land from the perspective of a colonizer because of raw materials and access. Uh, you have the one large river network, the Niger River, that goes through Nigeria. But it's really in the you know, the, the eastern half of Africa where the British are, uh, have a lot of control, starting in the north with Egypt and going more or less due south right to the southern tip of Africa uh, in South Africa. Um, and so there were, you know, a lot of modern nations made up that territory and it's quite extensive. It also, this map also gives you an idea of what the dominant language is in that place. So of course, you know, every region has its own local language, uh, but the unifying language of West Africa is definitely French. And all of the places that are in blue, the dominant language is English. Uh, I mean, it's Arabic in Egypt and in Sudan, but you go to the Southern part of Africa and while yes, you have those local languages, it's English, which is the, the language that unites. So starting in the north, we see that by the mid 19th century, Egypt had separated itself from the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire was very weak at this point, And so Egypt was able to secure its autonomy. It wasn't truly independent, but there were no Ottoman forces in Egypt that had any control whatsoever. Uh, in 1869, the Suez Canal is, uh, is, is completed. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, and that made Egypt an incredibly important place uh, geopolitically, looking at the whole world. Uh, in 1875, Egypt had had a bunch of loans from the British banks, 
and they defaulted on those loans, which means they couldn't pay for them anymore. And that gave the British the opportunity to just step in and take control. Uh, and so Britain, starting in the 1870s, is essentially in charge of Egypt. Uh, but that relationship gets, you know, the British become more dominant as time goes on. Egypt was forced to sell all of its stock in the Suez Canal. So all of the opportunities for Egypt to make money off of the Suez Canal went away. Uh, there was a nationalist uprising because, of course, nationalism is something that's spreading all over the world by the late 19th century. And that nationalist uprising led the British to do what they did, which is to uh, crack down. And so Egypt at that point became a what they referred to as a protectorate. Uh, you know, the British Empire decides that it needs to protect Egypt from itself, I guess. Uh, <clears throat> to the south of Egypt is, is Sudan, and Sudan is a much more sparsely populated area, and it's more diverse ethnically and religiously. Uh, the British uh, sent a, a, a expeditionary force uh, south along the Nile River, which flows through Sudan as well, and that expedition was massacred. And so the British, you know, they don't stand down uh, after you massacre their expedition. They're going to come at you even harder. And so the second time through, the British brought their machine guns, um, and that kind of settled any problem that the that the British imperialists, colonizers, had with the local population. At one point, the French tried to kind of horn in on the action in Sudan, and the Brits had to chase the French out as well, but that was less of an intense conflict. To go into a little bit more detail on the Suez Canal, it was built as a joint effort by Britain and France, and they had received permission to do so from the leader of Egypt at that time in the late 1850s. It took 10 years to build, and you can see from the map why they built it. Uh, India is the is one of the most important territories in the British Empire, uh, and if you could shave 5,000 miles off of the journey, uh, that was very, very desirable from a, from a trade and transportation perspective. Uh, so the canal zone, was declared an international zone in 1888, so that's after the British had already taken full control. And that and that Suez Canal zone, the idea is that anybody could use that waterway, that that waterway was not going to belong to any specific nation, and therefore it couldn't be closed, except by the British, because the British... Uh, were the was the empire that decided that they would uh, control that area and make sure that trade could flow freely. But the idea was that no single power would be able to close the canal. This, of course, changes in the 20th century after colonization. At the complete opposite end of Africa, we have the Cape Colony. And the Cape Colony was originally settled by the Dutch. Uh, when Napoleon went on his spree of conquering in Europe, one of the things that happened is the British Empire went around swooping up colonies that belonged to countries that were conquered by Napoleon. And this was, you know, supposedly to protect those colonies from, uh, you know, conquest by the French Empire. But of course, it was really just a land grab by the British. There were already Dutch settlers living there. They'd been living there for quite a long time, and they were known as Afrikaners, uh, although the Brits had a different name for them. They called them the Boers, and that's going to be kind of significant in a, in a moment. Um, once the British came in and took over Cape Colony, which you can see in the, is in the blue there in the map on the top, uh, the the Dutch settlers, the Afrikaners, they migrated. They were like... We don't want to be under British rule. And so they formed two new territories, which you can see kind of to the northwest of Cape Colony, the Orange Free State and the Transvaal. So they migrate north. They settle these two new areas so that they can go in their own direction and preserve their Dutch-based culture. 
one of the most significant figures in the history of this region was an Englishman named Cecil Rhodes. Uh, he was a capitalist. He owned mines, gold mines, diamond mines in Southern Africa. So that, of course, made him exceptionally wealthy. He was a British nationalist. He was also a social Darwinist, right? And we've talked about that. Um, he wanted to control or have the British control, uh, you know, even more land in Africa than they already did. He was the author of this so-called Cape to Cairo plan, meaning that the, you'd have this straight line of colonies starting in, uh, you know, right on the Mediterranean in Egypt and going all the way down to the southern tip of Africa. Uh, he eventually gains political power as the prime minister of the Cape Colony. And there's a nation that is formed to the north of South Africa uh, that for a long time was known as Rhodesia. Uh, and they changed the name post-colonization for very obvious reasons. For several decades, the Dutch settlers, the Afrikaners, uh, having moved north out of Cape Colony and into Transvaal, were living their life in peace and not really being bothered by the British Empire until gold and diamonds were discovered in Transvaal, at which point hundreds of thousands of Brits emigrated uh, to Transvaal and to the Orange Free Strait Orange Free State, uh, you know, to get in on the prospecting for gold and diamonds, at which point there were actually more people from Britain in Transvaal than there were Afrikaners, which, you know, the Afrikaners had a problem with. The, the Afrikaners had a leader of Transvaal who himself was a nationalist, and he wanted to drive all of the British people uh, out of Transvaal. And so they instituted uh, very strict rules. They, the speaking of English was banned in Transvaal, which is kind of difficult when hundreds of thousands of Britons live there. Uh, they were given no political rights at all. And the Afrikaners in Transvaal recognized that um, openly challenging the British Empire that way was a pretty stupid idea. And so that guy was overthrown. But that didn't stop a few years later, the Afrikaners from rising up uh, against the the British. And, and that leads to what the British know as the Boer War. Uh, and the Boer War is where the British Empire invaded Transvaal and the Orange Free State. Uh, needless to say, these rough and tumble characters that you can see in the lower right image, uh, you know, doesn't really matter how brave they were. There just weren't enough of them to be able to stand up to the British Empire. And in 1902, they surrender. But unlike non-white people, when the Afrikaners surrendered, they were given self-rule, which if we look at other places in the British Empire, most definitely did not happen. So these people of European heritage were given self-rule, even though they had just fought a, a small but brutal war against the British Empire. And then in 1910, all of the British colonies in Southern Africa were united. So Cape Colony, Transvaal, and the Orange Free State were joined together as the Union of South Africa, which then is, for all intents and purposes, an independent country, but it is a part of the empire. But, it, you know, it's sort of on the same level as Canada at that point. We'll move on now to British India and Southeast Asia. We spent a lot of time looking at the history of India right up until the Great Rebellion of 1857 that the British referred to as the Mutiny. Uh, after the rebellion, they the British finally dismantled or dis, uh, disbanded the East India Company that had been around since the year 1600, mainly because it wasn't necessary anymore. Uh, you know, the East India Company was a proxy for the British government so that they didn't really have to get involved in the day-to-day -day running of, uh, of India. But at, after the rebellion, they had taken direct control or virtually direct control over the entire Indian subcontinent, which meant that there was really no reason to have this, this, this buffer entity known as the East India Company. After the rebellion, the British did not take any more 
new territory, but every one of those so-called independent principalities uh, still had to do whatever the British wanted them to do. So there was, you know, they had self-rule, but if their interests collided with the interests of the British in any way, uh, you know who won that one. In 1877, uh, Queen Victoria is is declared the Empress of India. So, you know, we've been calling the British Empire an empire for a long time, but, you know, it's not until 1877 that the term is literal because now you have a British monarch who is also uh, an emperor, empress, right? And then later emperor. And so that lasts all the way into after World War II. Uh, the army that patrolled India was mostly Indian. You did have a few Britons, mostly as officers in, you know, in command. Uh, the Sikhs, who are Indian, uh, were had a had a significant presence within the the British army in India because they had allied themselves with the British against some of the other Indian princes some time ago. And then another group that are a part of that army are the the Gurkhas. And the Gurkhas are these elite troops from Nepal. Nepal is independent. Nepal, Nepal was not a part of the British Empire, but it was closely associated with it. And so the British hired the Gurkhas to uh, help, uh, you know, patrol India. Uh, the British, you know, had a couple of adventures, military adventures. For the most part, they were to counter the Russians. You know, the Russians, we've talked about this before, the Russians have been had been looking for a year-round warm water port for hundreds of years. And so even going into the 20th century, they sort of had their eyes on the Indian Ocean as a place where they could get to. So the British went into Afghanistan to try to limit the encroachment of the Russians, and uh, they were as successful as every other empire that has invaded Afghanistan, which is to say they were not at all successful, or at least since the Mongols, every empire that has tried to exert its authority over Afghanistan um, has eventually tucked tail and run away because it's, it's a very challenging area to successfully conquer, um, as Americans probably know. In terms of how the British ruled India, uh, they retained all of the senior positions in government. You had about 12,000 Britons, uh, British people, in the colonial government of India, uh, ruling 350 million Indians. Um, the, the, the capital, Delhi, uh, of India gets very hot, uh, much hotter than people who are from a very cold, rainy island off of the coast of Europe uh, are comfortable with. And so the British would move the capital to the foothills of the Himalayas every summer because it was cooler the further north and you had a lot of you know water running off of the mountains and that kind of thing. Um, education system is was run in English uh, and that really shaped the lives of people in India who sought an education. It, the Indian people themselves, however, did dominate uh, the professional classes, law, medicine, engineering, education. The legal system that was in place in India was based on English common law, you know, the English judicial system. And, you know, the British had a thriving society in India. When I say the British, I mean, you know, white people from Europe had, uh, you know, had a thriving society. Every year, hordes of young British women would uh, sail to India from Britain to, to uh, look for, you know, young men who were involved in the uh, operation of either the colonial government or the army, um, lots of eligible bachelors. There were some British families that had lived in India for, you know, a hundred years or possibly even more. And those folks were referred to as Anglo-Indians. So they are people, they're white people, 
Um, but they have, you know, their all of their, their, uh, you know, they'd lived in that country for a very, very long time and were maybe a bit more aligned with it. But they did still maintain British clubs, uh, you know, where Indian people weren't allowed, which of course leads to uh, resentment. And you also had, uh, you know, intermarriage, you know, and so you had biracial people, you had people who were half Indian and half English. And as is sadly often the case, those people were, were rejected by both groups, right? They were not English enough to be accepted by the British, and they were not Indian enough uh, to be accepted by other Indian people. Because of the riches of India, the British Empire felt no need to invest tons of money into uh, running India. And so the British Parliament regularly underfunded India and the revenue that did go to India was really just used for, uh, for the military. You did have a thriving local economy, plenty of Indian entrepreneurs. Uh, you know, we saw at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, a switch in the production of textiles from, you know, hand looms to, uh, to machine looms. And so you have India is producing a tremendous amount of textiles. And they actually also start to establish some factories in some of the major metropolitan areas like Bombay or Mumbai, as we know it now. Uh, they built railroads, again, for commercial purposes. Uh, you, you know, once you build a railroad into the interior, now you have another uh, opening to more agriculture. And we're talking about, you know, uh, cash crops, commercial agriculture. So tea, uh, indigo, which is a, you know, it's a, it's a coloring, it's a dye and spices. They, the, the British had built the largest rail network in all of Asia by 1900 throughout, uh, India. Um, sadly, a lot of the regular people were displaced by that commercial agriculture. You know, so you similar things that you saw in in Europe a century or two earlier, where large entities come in and and buy up lots of land, and that then displaces and dissociates uh, the 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 smaller communities that had existed there for hundreds or perhaps thousands of years. Um, they also built a, a tremendous irrigation system, biggest in the world by, by the year 1900. And again, that's, of course, just for the commercial agriculture. And yet, it kind of, we see this a lot, that even though there was all of this, you know, great economic activity happening, it was mostly benefiting the, the upper classes and the British. Uh, most Indians remained very poor. And in fact, their standard of living went down because when you have population growth and you have a lower death rate, you know, advances in medicine and that kind of thing, then you end up with more people. And if you have more people, but the same amount of resources, then you have to spread those limited resources over a larger group of people. And so cost of, or excuse me, not cost of living, but, you know, the, the quality of life went down during this period. As we kind of also saw with the early phases of industrialization in Europe. India wasn't ever really one place prior to the British uniting India into one giant uh, colony. And so there was never really any fertile ground for Indian nationalism prior to the British Empire united India. And the, the foundation of Indian nationalism was the fact that the British treated Indian people like second-class citizens in their own country. The British Empire wasn't doing nearly enough to combat poverty, even though they had tons of money to go and try to and fail to invade Afghanistan. And so in 1885, you get the first uh, unified independence movement called the Indian National Congress. And it was ironically uh, founded by an Englishman, um, but he was reacting to what he saw 
the British doing and saw it in opposition to the idea of self-government and self-determination. Um, so, you know, it starts with uh, an Englishman, but, you know, obviously it then becomes a major uh, force for Indian people to uh, advocate for themselves. Uh, they engaged in acts of resistance. They would boycott British goods. And uh, since the British are ultimately everywhere for the sake of markets, uh, if you boycott their goods, they're going to fight back. Uh, and so, you know, leaders of the boycotts were jailed. There are all other forms of uh, repression. But uh, one of the early Indian nationalists, a members, member of the Indian National Congress, is a dude who you've probably heard of named Mohandas Gandhi. And you can actually see him as a very young man in the top photo there circled. Uh, and then looking perhaps a bit more like you're used to seeing him in the image in the lower right. So after World War One, he, you know, he's been around since the 1880s, but after World War One, he starts his civil disobedience movement, uh, partly because they, the Indian people accept, expected to be able to rule themselves after World War One, uh, and that did not happen. But we'll pick up the story of India after World War Two in a future lecture. Just to the east of India is a place called Burma, although it, it has a different name now. Um, originally, the British just wanted the coastal areas uh, for the same reason that they do everything, which is to for trade. That if they get exclusive trading rights in those coastal areas, then they can dominate the interior. Um, but they also had this pattern that we've seen before, which is they provoke a war, uh, which then allows them to take more of the land. And eventually they just decided to take all of it. And they incorporated it, even though it's culturally very different from India, they incorporated it into British India. And it was, it was governed as a part of India until the 1930s. Uh, once they had full control over Burma, then it became commercialized. Just like we saw in India, they built railroads into the interior for the purposes of uh, agriculture as well as access to natural resources. A lot of timber, a lot of wood uh, in the, the jungles of Burma. Uh, there were also uh, oil, there's oil deposits. And so after 1880, when oil becomes... Uh, a much more important commodity, uh, they're able to get oil out of Burma. And then they built rice plantations along the coastal, you know, the, the areas around the mouths of, of rivers. And that's obviously for food production. Eventually, post-colonization, you know, in the latter half of the 20th century, Burma officially changed its name to Myanmar. Uh, although um, in very, very British uh, tradition to this day, the British government and British media refuse to call it Myanmar. They continue to call it Burma because they're the British. The southernmost portion of Southeast Asia is called the Malay Peninsula. And in 1819, the British built a small city state at the very southernmost tip of the Malay Peninsula called Singapore. And Singapore kind of uh, hangs right over one of the most important waterways in the entire world, which is the Strait of Malacca. Uh, it, 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 just like the Suez Canal, shaves a tremendous amount of time off of the journey from Europe to India. Uh, the Strait of Malacca shaves a tremendous amount of time off of uh, the, the journey from East Asia to India and Europe and so forth. Uh, Singapore was ethnically diverse. You had British people, you had Indian people, you had Chinese people, as well as the native people of the Malay Peninsula. Uh, the peninsula itself is pretty thinly populated and it wasn't developed at all before uh, 1900. But later on in that, in that never ending quest for raw materials, uh, they discovered deposits of tin, as well as rubber plantations, which become immensely important in the 20th century and are a significant factor in uh, the, the, the beginning of the Second World War. 
uh, a lot of Chinese labor was imported into uh, the, uh, Malaya. It's called Malaya when it's a British colony and it's the modern day nation of Malaysia. Uh, so a lot of Chinese people were brought in. Uh, nowadays, people of Chinese heritage are half of the population of Malaysia. And, you know, just like any situation where you have an indigenous group of people and you have, you know, immigrants, because that's what they were, they were immigrants, is there's a lot of resentment. But I think that that is a dynamic that a lot of us are familiar with. There is a saying, the sun never sets on the British Empire, and maybe by now you're getting a sense of why, because we haven't even gotten into the last area of the world that the British colonized, and that's Oceania. So Australia. We mentioned Australia very briefly at the end of the presentation that covered the American Revolution, uh, because once the American colonies were gone, uh, they needed another place that they needed to colonize, and that ended up being Australia, which they started in 1788. But it was so far away from Europe that it was they had a lot of difficulty getting people interested in moving there. Uh, eventually, Australia ends up as being six different colonies, uh, and uh, the 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 way that the British figured out how to develop the colonies of Australia was by sending prisoners there. Um, 160,000 uh, convicted criminals from Great Britain got sent to Australia. There's a joke that, you know, the, the British criminals who got away went to America and the ones that didn't went to Australia. There were an indigenous people there, the Aboriginal Australians, but they, they by European standards, they were quite primitive from a technological perspective. And so they were no threat at all to these Europeans. Australia has a very harsh climate. Uh, it's very difficult to farm without irrigation in Australia. And so uh, the dominant forms of agriculture that were practiced in Australia were ranching and, and sheep herding. Uh, there were farms, but they had to be heavily irrigated in order to be functional. And just as sometimes you see in places like the American Southwest, there is tension between uh, farmers and ranchers because there's only a certain amount of arable land that can be used and they all have their own uh, priorities. There's a gold rush in the 1850s that l leads to another influx of people from Europe. And finally, in 1901, just as we saw with South Africa, but without the war, the various colonies that made up the continent of Australia were united into the Commonwealth of Australia. And Australia is a federation, the same as the United States. So each of those former colonies, which are now called states, they have their own local government, they have their own state government, and then you have a federal government that oversees the entire country. So, you know, they have a smaller number of states than America does, but it, it's essentially the, the form of government is structured similarly. Several hundred miles to the east of Australia, you have the colony of New Zealand, which wasn't colonized until 1840 and only was colonized uh, because the French had their eye on uh, New Zealand and the British were really not interested in allowing the French to have any land that they wanted. Uh, unlike other islands, and Australia for that matter, uh, New Zealand actually had a pretty powerful indigenous people called the Maori. They were populist, they were organized, they had a militant or a militaristic uh, culture. And so, you know, they didn't have the technology that the British had, which meant that eventually their their efforts to resist European colonization uh, were not going to be successful. But they held out much, much longer because of the, the nature of their society. Uh, you had missionaries, as you often do, where whenever the Europeans go and colonize someplace, and they, they were pretty successful in converting the Maori people, or at least a percentage of the Maori people, to uh, to Christianity, but there was a fight 
between missionaries and imperialists because the missionaries wanted to help the Maori people. They wanted to Christianize them, which they saw as helping them, but ultimately they wanted to help them, whereas the imperialists were kind of more interested in exterminating them. They wanted New Zealand to be a, a white country or a white dominant country, uh, the way that Australia became, the way that the United States became. Uh, the, the Maori resisted for decades, but ultimately it became a question of numbers. Uh, you know, every time the Maori fought a battle and lost, they lost Maori warriors. And by 1872, there were only 40,000 Maori left in New Zealand, whereas there were 200,000 colonizers. And so at that point, there was no reasonable path to resistance for the Maori people. But the Maori culture is still a very important component of the culture of uh, New Zealand. And in 1907, we see the same thing that we saw with Australia and the Union of South Africa. And we didn't cover it in this lecture, but Canada the same way is that it becomes a dominion. And so for all intents and purposes, by 1907, uh, New Zealand is an independent country. It is a part of the empire, but it is politically independent in the same way that Canada and Australia and South Africa were. We'll now take a brief look at French imperialism. The first thing to understand about the French empire is that it was only as big as the British allowed it to get. Uh, you know, the, 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 after the Napoleonic Wars, the British are pretty domino over the French. So the areas of the world that the British weren't terribly interested in controlling, uh, they left for the French. And so for the most part, that's, that's North Africa. Uh, that was a region of Africa that the British weren't very interested in. There wasn't a ton going on outside of the places where the British were already uh, in control, like such as Nigeria. Uh, and then there are a few places, of, you know, islands around the world, that kind of thing. And then you have French Indochina. Uh, so modern day Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia. Uh, and that's really it for by 1914 for the for the so-called French Empire. One area that we've not spent a lot of time talking about is this particular region of Southeast Asia that during this period is known as French Indochina. The French had sent missionaries uh, into that area because, of course, you know, Europeans do like to convert people to Christianity. Uh, and they were persecuted, and that gave the French the opportunity to just roll in and invade. And once they'd conquered the southern part of Vietnam, it wasn't terribly hard with their more sophisticated uh, weaponry to be able to move deeper into the interior. And eventually they took over all of those lands that you can see on the map there and united them into this entity that they referred to as French Indochina. Um, unlike the British, who were mostly there, you know, in their colonies for commercial reasons, uh, the British at least tried to stay hands off as much as was possible, whereas the French were much more oppressive. They forced Frenchness onto the Vietnamese people in a way that the British never forced Englishness onto the Indian people. The Indians were not forced to speak English. They saw advantages to speaking English. Uh, trade possibilities, that uh, educational opportunity. But the French forced Vietnamese people to speak French. They were not allowed any political activity, and it, it was really run as a police state. Um, Vietnamese leaders who agitated for self-governance, you know, nationalists, people like that, were just, you know, exiled or executed. Uh, an incredibly important figure in the history of Vietnam comes to the fore the towards the end of this um, period of expansion of empire. And that's a gentleman named Ho Chi Minh. And he originally sought out, you know, cooperative agreements, but eventually recognized that the only way that the Vietnamese people were going to gain independence was through uh, violent conflict. And so he leads the Vietnamese people right up until 
you know, the last part of the Vietnam War that that the United States fought um, against the 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 Vietnamese people who were seeking self government. Uh, Ho Chi Minh went to Europe to be educated uh, in France, of course, because you know that's how the colonial system worked. And he, he actually had a number of interesting positions uh, in Europe that we will talk more about in a future lecture. When we talk about imperialism and colonization, we tend to associate that only with colonizers coming from Europe. But one of the pretty significant players during this period is actually Japan. We know from previous lectures that when the Tokugawa shogunate fell uh, in the mid 19th century, that the direct rule of the emperor was restored, and that was called the Meiji Restoration. Uh, and after that happened, Japan embarked on a massive westernization and modernization uh, effort all across Japanese society, not just with technology. You, you also see nationalism become a factor in Japan, you know, nationalism is this contagion that spreads all around the world during the late 19th century. And so the emperor himself becomes a rallying point for that Japanese nationalism. And what they realized is that the way that they were going to be able to gain their independence again, they were never fully conquered. But, you know, when the Americans kicked the door in, that definitely placed them in kind of a subordinate Position And so they recognized that the, the way that they were going to get independence again is by mastering Western technology, specifically military technology. And in order for that to happen, they had to have industrialization. They recognized that they couldn't just depend upon other powers to supply them with the equipment, that they were going to have to learn how to do it themselves and then do it at least as well as the Europeans did. Uh, they hired experts from Europe to come in and help them build factories and industrialize their economy overall. They also adopted, uh, you know, Western form of government. They had a constitutional monarchy. So, you know, yes, the emperor is this rallying point for Japanese nationalism, but ultimately it's not direct rule over the people. It's a constitutional monarchy. Japan forms a parliament and they adopt uh, a legal system that looks a lot like Western legal systems. And so the samurai never go away. I mean, eventually they do, but, but during this period, they don't go away, but they just become bureaucrats. You know, samurai are military officers going forward, that kind of thing. Once Japan industrialized, they also wanted to expand their influence. They wanted to become colonizers also. Uh, and so by 1895, they're seeking to uh, build an empire for themselves in East Asia. They beat China in a war in 1895, which gave them Korea and the island of Taiwan. And then uh, even more significant, in 1904 and 05, they fought a war against Russia. And Russia was a European power, and they were white, and they saw themselves as being genetically superior to all East Asian peoples. And so they their defeat of the Russians made all of Europe wake up and realize that Japan was a power to be taken seriously. Uh, the Russians were unprepared for the war. They were very far from home. Uh, you know, we're talking 4,000 miles, 5,000 miles away from European Russia. And the fact that they were able to, that the Japanese were able to defeat the Russians becomes a source of national pride that look at this island nation that had been, you know, not truly colonized, but certainly had fallen under the sway of the European powers just 40 years earlier. And now they are standing tall against one of the major powers of Europe. Now, if we're being fair, it's the weakest of the major powers of Europe. Russia, but but still a significant uh, uh, defeat. The treaty was brokered by Theodore Roosevelt, who actually won the Nobel Peace Prize for his efforts in ending the war between Japan and Russia. And of course, after this war, 
it's clear that that the Japanese are powerful enough that all of those treaties that the Europeans put into place that were you know disadvantaged Japan, those were all over. Uh, Japan was not going to be a country that was going to be rolling over to the Europeans anymore. Empires don't last very long if they don't expand. And so, you know, the Japanese set out to build an empire and that's what you have to do. You have to keep expanding. So they, they had taken Taiwan in 1895 from China. They turned it into an agricultural colony. At the end of the war with Russia, they were in control of Manchuria, and Manchuria was going to be a great source of natural resource, resources, but also another agricultural area, and an industrialization area. So the Japanese built new cities and built large factories to support their economy. Japan itself is not very large in terms of territory. Uh, and so... They end up stimulating a lot of migration uh, of the Han Chinese people from China into Manchuria to work in those, in those factories. Uh, in 1910, the Japanese overthrew the Yi dynasty of Korea that had been there for a thousand years, and Korea officially becomes a colony of Japan. And it continues to remain a colony of Japan until after the end of the Second World War. Uh, Korea was another place. It was a great source of natural resources. Um, but uh, the Korean people were horrifically mistreated by the Japanese Empire. They were exploited. They were refused. They were banned from uh, education, from even learning their own native language. They were forced to adopt Japanese names or naming conventions. Uh, so it was pretty brutal conquest of, of Korea. They did build, just like the British, they built a lot of modern infrastructure, but only for their benefit. Ultimately, the reason why the British built railroads all across India was to uh, help improve their own economy. It wasn't just out of the goodness of their heart. And the same we see is true with Japan. They build, you know, huge industrial complexes, factories, they build railroad networks, they build hydroelectric power facilities because we're getting into the period where electricity is a thing. Uh, and again, that's ultimately all to serve the Japanese empire. Japan actually joined World War I with the Allies, meaning you know Britain, France, the United States, and so forth, uh, Russia for a little bit of time. But they didn't actually send troops to Europe. Uh, the reason why they joined was they wanted a shot at grabbing all of the German colonies in China once the war is over, which they succeeded in doing. So that was it for the main imperial powers in this period, but there were a few other countries that had some pretty significant colonies that we'll take a look at. By the latter half of the 19th century, the Dutch were not significant imperial players. Uh, a lot of their colonies had already been picked off during the Napoleonic Wars, such as the Cape Colony of South Africa. Uh, but they continued to maintain their hold over the East Indies. And as the dominant players in the what the Europeans referred to as the Spice Islands, their economic goal was to exclude all of the other powers. We know going all the way back to, say, for example, the founding of what is now New York City, that the Dutch, it was a commercial empire. There were never a dominant military force other than suppressing the native peoples in whatever areas that they were in control of. But they weren't fighting major wars against other imperial powers. So they were just ultimately like the British. They were interested in commerce. They were interested in exploiting natural resources uh, in the areas that they controlled. And so in the East Indies, which is now the nation of Indonesia, more or less, uh, you have sugar, coffee, tea, spices, rubber, and eventually oil as well. So a tremendous amount of commercial agriculture, cash crops, uh, sugar, coffee, were, and certain spices were worth tremendous amounts of money uh, during this period, especially in the case of coffee, before you have huge coffee plantations set up in places like Hawaii uh, and Brazil, you have the East Indies as being one of the dominant players there. Um, after 
the colonial takeover of all of the islands, then the, the native peoples of what is now Indonesia were forced to work on those cash crop um, mass agriculture operations, very similar to what we see in India. And of course, that's all for the profit of the Netherlands. It's not for the, the people there. They had political independence until the late 19th century and eventually uh, direct rule on the coastal areas. So in a, similar to the British, originally the Dutch weren't interested in controlling all of the islands. They just wanted to control the commercial centers and to control the trade and make as much money off of it as possible. But like what happened in India, eventually it got to the point where the Dutch felt the need to extend political control over all of the coastal areas. Uh, but they never really penetrated into the interior or certainly at all into the highlands of New Guinea. That never happened uh, at all. Um, but once the Dutch had political control over all of the, of the Indies, or at least the parts, you know, the coastal areas, uh, unlike in India, there were no native people in the government. Uh, you know, in India, it was just the senior positions of government that were reserved for the British people. The Dutch had full control over those islands. And like we also saw in India, you know, as you have life expectancy going up and overall just a larger population, then living standards are going to go down and the Dutch are making money off of that whole cycle. Another small European country with a large chunk of colonial property was Belgium. Uh, Belgium controlled a, a what is now the modern nation of uh, Congo for decades. And unlike the other colonies, uh, the Belgian Congo was owned directly by the Belgian king, right? As opposed to every other country that was engaging in colonization, it was the nation itself that was in control. But King Leopold uh, privately financed this entity that went about uh, buying up or tricking, you know, tribal leaders out of their land and ended up with this massive territory in uh, Central Africa. They uh, established a, a political entity called the Congo Free State. It was governed directly by that king, King Leopold, and some truly, truly horrific stuff happened uh, during this period of the late 19th century. Uh, a lot of forced labor, so slave labor. Um, there are a lot of uh, acquisition of ivory, so you know you're killing a lot of elephants. Um, as well as uh, a lot of rubber supply. Rubber, you know, comes from trees. So you have a lot of rubber trees there. Uh, but it was, it was horrific. It was uh, 10 million people were killed in 20 years. Uh, and, you know, there was just the, the lack of regard for um, humanity is, is, is pretty vile when you look at this period. In 1908, Leopold decided to just hand over his own private colony to the Belgian government, at which point conditions do improve slightly. You're not just having raw, vicious capitalism ruling over that territory. There are some standards, kind of, that could put into place. Because Germany and Italy became independent and united countries so late, they were also quite late to the colonization game. By the time they were in a position to be able to start acquiring colonies, there just weren't that many colonies left, possible colonies left, uh, because most of the territory of Africa and East Asia had, uh, and South Asia had already been taken by, for the most part, Britain or France. Uh, they couldn't touch the Western Hemisphere because they didn't want to get into a fight with the United States. So Italy only ends up with a couple of pieces of land in North and East Africa. Uh, Germany had a little bit more, but again, it's the leftovers in Africa that uh, they're able to 
uh, get control of. And a large part of the reason why they were is because of that uh, the meeting that they had in 1885 where they divided up Africa amongst themselves and the leader of Germany at that time, the Chancellor Bismarck, was the one who was in control of that meeting and they were able to get their hands on a few places in Africa. Uh, but uh, they weren't able to establish a dominant position around the world in the way that for example, Britain and France were able to do so. Uh, and then after Bismarck was out of power, they made even more efforts to try to get a hold as much uh, territory as possible. And then we get to the good old United States of America. America, at different points in its history, has had imperial ambitions at the very least. But we never had a large number of colonies, uh, at least outside of North America, as you know, during the period of westward expansion, you could theoretically refer to different parts of the Western United States as colonies. Um, but in terms of overseas colonies, we didn't really have any until the Spanish-American War. We beat Spain. We took control of uh, Cuba, of course, and Puerto Rico, a uh, few other islands like Guam. Uh, but the big thing that we took from Spain were, was the Philippine island chain. Uh, and when we arrived, the Filipinos were happy because we told them we were coming to the Philippines to free them from an imperial power. And we lied because we weren't there to free them. We were there to take that land for ourselves. And once the Filipinos realized that, they uh, rose up against us. And so there was a war that I'll bet you've never heard of before because it has been ignored throughout history, and that's the Philippine War. Uh, it was only three years long. It was essentially a guerrilla war that our military was fighting to uh, take control over. And, you know, ultimately, we were successful in gaining control of the Philippines because our military technology was just so so superior and our numbers were so superior to uh, as opposed to the guerrillas. Uh, it was a horrific time in the history of the Philippines. During that period, that three year period, one out of every seven Filipinos died from either the actual military conflict or famine or a disease as, as a result of those other things. So it's a very dark time, and often uh, countries like to sweep the ugliest aspects of their history under the rug. Uh, it, you know, there's no way we could sweep slavery or you know, the Vietnam War or anything like that under the rug, but the Philippine War, we did a good job of it. You know, all of the American history textbooks cover the Spanish-American War, uh, very few of them cover the Philippine War. Uh, we had a very exploitative rule over the Philippines, so identical to what we see with the British in India or the Dutch in the East Indies, Indonesia. Uh, we also did what a lot of these other colonizers did. It's, we, we found wealthy Filipinos that we could uh, that we could get you know control with by partnering with them to advance their own uh, economic priorities. We also did what we see happening in other places. We built modern roads and hospitals, and railroads, education system, all of that kind of stuff. But we didn't really care at all about the living conditions of regular Filipinos. Uh, you know, we said that we wanted to create a democratic nation, um, but you know, our, our colonial rule uh, was, was no less terrible than anything that the European powers were doing in their colonies. All of the places around the world that we've looked at so far have been places where there was really just one imperial power that was engaged in colonization. But we'll now look at a couple of places where there were multiple imperial powers trying to gain control. And the first one we'll look at is China, because China had been under siege going all the way back into 
the earlier part of the 19th century with the Opium Wars, and it just gets worse from there. So after the first Opium War, the British are able to gain all sorts of trading privileges within China, uh, and then other powers followed as well, the other European powers. One thing that was an advantage for Europeans is that they made themselves immune from Chinese law and they got to follow their own customs and kind of exist in a parallel universe along with uh, the Han Chinese. There were great amounts of exports. Uh, you know, China had been exporting things like silk to Europe for a couple thousand years. Uh, and now the Europeans actually have control of that trade. They, of course, continue to import opium into China because it was a very successful way of bringing an entire great nation to its knees. Uh, they also engaged in production of textiles and even start towards the end of the 19th century building some factories. And we see Japan gets involved in that as well. China refused to go along with some of the treaty provisions that were forced upon them. And so in 1858, there is a second opium war. And after China loses that war, they're basically a colony. They're just a colony of uh, more than one country. So you have more cities and ports opened to Europeans. Um, but unlike Japan, which recognized the need to adopt certain aspects of European uh, culture, right? Uh, European forms of government, European technology, European industrialization, European military tactics. China didn't want to do that because China, you know, the Chinese saw themselves as being superior to all other cultures, even though at this point, I mean, judgments of culture aside, uh, you know, the Europeans, the Americans, even the Japanese, are much more successful at this point in history than is China. Uh, Russia gets into the game also. Russia invaded Manchuria and took over some of those coastal areas. Uh, but of course, in 1904, we see Japan defeat uh, uh, Russia in, in Manchuria. And then we also, they also start to mess around in one of the internal territories of China called Xinjiang province, which we've talked about before and we'll definitely be talking about again. After the British success in the first Opium War, where they were able to open access to a number of Chinese ports, that practice expanded and grew. And by 1910, you have a hundred ports just like that. And you have Europeans operating in all of them. And in all of those places, the Chinese people themselves were being treated like second-class citizens, much as we saw in India. But you know, China was a much older and more advanced and prouder society than some of the areas of India. The Europeans opened clubs that were just for themselves, again, like we saw in India. And there was a lot of resentment of the arrogance of the Europeans coming in and kind of taking over the economy of China. By 1895, Japan is in the mix and they earn the right to start building factories in those treaty ports. And this is when Finally, China begins to industrialize. China really had engaged in no industry prior to uh, the Europeans and the Japanese starting to build factories in the areas that they had influence over. And all of this ends up being a great humiliation for the Chinese people. Their society was thousands of years old. Their empire was 2,000 years old. And yet here are all these much newer civilizations coming in and really taking at least economic control over China. But that leads to the growth of Chinese nationalism, which becomes a major factor in the 20th century. The Taiping Rebellion is one of the most horrific events in world history that you've probably never even heard of. And I say that because, honestly, until I started teaching this course, I'd never really heard of it. Uh, it starts with a scholar who was trying to get into the civil service and he failed the exam and he felt that it was because uh, other people who were less qualified than he were, you know, had political connections and were able to get into the civil service. So he somehow ends up leading a massive protest of, of the peasantry to actually overthrow 
the Qing Emperor in 1850. So they march all the way up to Beijing to try to uh, take over the government. Uh, and, you know, you have lots of problems that are leading into this, massive poverty, uh, overpopulation. The Chinese had just already lost the first opium war, which, again, you get into this sense of, you know, national inferiority. And the rebellion spreads. It spreads to lots of cities across China, and it take, took almost 15 years to put down in the in that court in that period of time 40 million people were killed i mean that's 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 almost world war ii levels of death and yet you don't have the kind of more sophisticated military technology that can lead to that level of of mass death the most productive agriculturally productive areas of china were utterly destroyed and then of course you get even more starvation when you can't grow enough food because all of this land has been torn up. The Uyghur people, who are the the Muslims uh, who live in the Xinjiang province, who are currently experiencing a genocide right now in China in the 21st century, they also rose up because they are not Han, Han Chinese. They're not ethnically or linguistically or religiously connected to uh, the people of, you know, what is the modern day Eastern China. And, you know, we tend to focus a lot on imperialism and this lecture is about imperialism, but it's important to note that all of the negativity that came out of Western imperialism, all of the economic damage, the military damage from the couple of wars, it had nothing, absolutely nothing compared to the devastation and damage and death associated with the Taiping Rebellion. We now know that any time Europeans roll into a place to become colonizers, they're bringing Christianity with them. And uh, Christianity was a very, very hard sell in China. Uh, again, China had this culture, this civilization, this empire that literally was older than Christianity by several hundred years. Uh, and so this this sense of, um, uh, you know, thinking of the Europeans as being inferior extended to uh, embracing Christianity. And so there's this term from this period called rice Christians. Um, you know, the missionaries, as they do in a lot of places, uh, engaged in some humanitarian efforts, uh, such as, you know, feeding the needy and the poor and, uh, you know, providing education and that kind of thing. And so there were there were quite a few Chinese people who, you know, never really truly embraced Christianity, but they uh, engaged with the missionaries because they would gain, you know, really important things like food and education. Uh, and so that's how they get drawn to some of the mission schools uh, and hospitals, because by 1900, you know, the, the European run hospitals are being run based upon Western medicine as opposed to Eastern medicine. And that certainly brings advantages uh, with it. The, the rural areas, the, the efforts of the missionaries a lot of times uh, provoked, you know, anti-Western riots in those rural areas. Most Europeans stayed in those treaty ports. They're a little bit safer there. Um, but it was the missionaries that went out into the very, very rural areas and that kind of, you know, sometimes even put them at risk. Uh, you know, there were a lot of Americans, American missionaries, for sure. Uh, and, you know, the Americans weren't messing around. They would, if they, if their missionaries or their traders or whatever uh, got attacked by the Chinese, then the Americans would engage in this, in this term gunboat diplomacy, which is, if we're not getting what we want from you, then we will park a naval vessel off of the coast of your village and point its guns at your village, and then you're going to do what we want you to do, because otherwise we're going to blow up your whole town. Uh, in 1900, there was this uprising that was kind of pushed on by the uh, by the emperor, by the Qing emperor, and a group of rebels went through a lot of the treaty ports and some of the more rural areas, and they were burning missions down, they were killing Westerners, uh, they also killed Chinese Christians. Um, you know, adopting the religion of the colonizer uh, doesn't exactly 
you know, put you on firm footing with the with your your fellow Han Chinese. Uh, it didn't last for very long, unsurprisingly. Uh, this is one of the times where the European powers kind of all came together to put a military expedition on the ground and put that rebellion down. Uh, instead of, well, let's just say that the Qing emperor didn't really read the room because after this failed rebellion, then uh, the emperor declared war on all of the foreign powers. Uh, and needless to say, both the Europeans and the Japanese engaged in pretty brutal reprisals on the Chinese people in those treaty ports. They closed in on Beijing itself, which then led the court of the Qing emperor to actually flee the capital. Uh, and after the rebellion, there was a massive indemnity, which just means we are going to require you to pay us. Uh, and that was based upon loss of life, but also loss of commercial opportunities and, you know, uh, cash crops that were destroyed and, and that kind of a thing. And eventually this leads to the fall of the Qing dynasty. But it's not just the Qing dynasty that falls. It's the actual entire Chinese empire. The Chinese empire had been in existence since uh, the second century BCE. Right, so more than two thousand years, uh, it had existed. And yes, there had been different dynasties over the years, but the dynasties were just the ruling families of the empire. But in 1911, the Chinese Empire collapses for good. The other place in the world that all of the European powers were kind of buttoned up against each other, trying to get as much land as possible, was of course Africa. Before the beginning of the 19th century, imperialism had not extended very far into Africa. Of course, North Africa had always been integrated in the Mediterranean world, and at that point it was still, for the most part, under the control of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, but, you know, again, the, the Dutch had control of the Cape Colony at that point. There were a couple of other areas that were under control of Portugal, but it was mostly unexplored uh, and you know, kind of undamaged by Europeans. You did see an increase in population kind of all across the continent, and that had a lot to do with better farming practices that they did sort of learn secondhand from the Europeans. Uh, the Bantu people, who originally started around Nigeria-ish, so kind of Western Africa, that, that, uh, that group of people that culture, that language group, spread it into Central and eventually into Southern Africa as well. At the point at which the, the Bantu arrived, those areas were very sparsely populated. Um, but you see this domino effect where the Bantu come in and they di displace one group of people who then move further south and displace another group of people. And so slowly but surely, you have this one cultural group with one language family, the Bantu language family, that spreads through much of Central and Southern Africa. Slavery was practiced in Africa. Once uh, the Americans or the, you know, the, the European powers in the colonies figured out the, the plantation system, African rulers themselves set up American-style uh, plantations. Just like in the earlier period of history in Africa, there's a lot of trade in ivory and gold and spices and things like that. Um, there's a small island in East Africa called Zanzibar, and it is it, it was, and to a certain extent still is, dominated by Arabs. Uh, it's Islam is practiced there. And those Arab rulers had access to you know, advanced military technologies, which allowed them to dominate the interior of East Africa, at least until the British showed up, and then they wouldn't be able to hang on in a fight against the British. But there were only, as we said earlier, there's only a couple of places in Africa that were never colonized, or at least not until very, very late in the colonial period, and that would be Ethiopia, which was a Christian nation, and then Liberia, which we've already talked about. As was mentioned briefly 
earlier, in 1885, all of the major powers of Europe held a conference called the Berlin Conference, because that's where it was. And it was called for by uh, Chancellor Bismarck of Germany. And they just wanted to have a conversation about, okay, how are we going to cut this entire continent up? And of course, no one is paying attention to uh, the needs or the desires of the people that actually live there, because that's how colonization works. And so 90% of the continent gets divided up. So all of the pieces of Africa, other than Ethiopia and Liberia, that were not already under the control of a European power, got assigned to a European power. And, you know, originally they were mostly coastal settlements because they were primarily interested in trade. Uh, they now are able to gain control of the interior sort of the, you know, moving inland from their coastal possession and develop those areas uh, as well. The French and the British were in conflict, as they often were. Uh, the British, of course, were seeking that north-south axis, the, the Cape to Cairo plan, uh, whereas the French wanted to have an east-west axis across the northern half of Africa and control all of that. And the place where those two axes meet was in Sudan. And that's why they almost had a war over Sudan. Uh, and But eventually the British were able to make it clear to the French that they wouldn't really last in that fight very long. There was some resistance to colonization. Uh, the nomads of the Sahara Desert, who had been traveling through those areas for thousands of years, were not terribly interested in submitting to the Europeans, uh, nor were the Sudanese Muslims. Uh, nor were the Zulu people. The Zulu were the dominant people in southern Africa, uh, and they fought the Europeans throughout the mid-19th century. Uh, one of their most famous rulers was a, a guy named uh, Shaka, who uh, was actually succeeded in, in at least temporarily, uh, defeating the British. Um, but by the 1870s, when the British come in with much more sophisticated military equipment, including the earliest thing that we can call a machine gun, which is the Gatling gun, which is, uh, you know, it was like a whole rotating set of barrels. There was just no way that an unindustrialized people could stand up to that kind of military technology. And then another group of people that uh, were a part of the resistance were westernized Africans, right? People of African descent or people actually born in Africa uh, who you know, go to a European country or perhaps the United States, uh, become educated and then come home and step into leadership uh, positions. Eventually, it's these groups of people that end up leading the independence movements across Africa in the mid 20th century. The continent of Africa is probably the place where the most horrific atrocities that's involved in colonization happened, at least in the 19th century. Some pretty bad stuff happened in the Americas under the Spanish, but that was in the 16th century. Um, in terms of consequences, the Europeans made a lot of money off of it. It did create more tension between the European powers because, again, like we saw with Britain and France, uh, you know, there's, there's going to be more struggle there for sure. Uh, Africa is transformed linguistically, you know, the European languages begin to dominate uh, religiously. You have a widespread Christianity. Where, you know, Christianity didn't take it all in, in China, but it really did take in a lot of places in Africa. You see massive exploitation of natural resources. Uh, basically, all of the good agricultural land gets taken away from native African peoples just like we saw in India uh, and the Philippines and lots of other places, you have the Europeans building a lot of infrastructure for their benefit. Roads, railroads, telegraph, all that kind of stuff to allow them to maintain contact with the interior of their colonies. Um, Africans were treated so brutally, uh, much, much worse, as poorly as native peoples were treated in places like India, it was much, much worse in Africa. There was no, you know, just like with slavery in North America, um, you know, there was no uh, effort to, you know, keep families together. 
uh, it, it was a devastation to the cultures, destruction really of a lot of the cultures of, of, of Africa. And the countries themselves didn't really conform to uh, political, you know, uh, cultural boundaries within Africa. The lines on the map that make up the modern nation states of Africa were all drawn by the European colonial powers. And so a lot of times those random lines on a map did not correspond to the traditional lands held by various tribes. And so you get in places like Uganda, where there was a horrific genocide in 1994, part of the reason why that happened is you had two hostile tribal groups that were forced by the British into the same country. Uh, whereas if you had separated or allowed self-determination, you might have avoided some of the worst aspects of that kind of thing. And so now we'll just take a brief look and see the, the differences in the political boundaries between 1880, which was before the Berlin Conference, and 1913, when the entire continent of Africa, other than Liberia, uh, was colonized. Eventually, the Italians, um, and eventually, well, it comes a little bit later, but they, they successfully invade and conquer Ethiopia. And lastly, we will look at the colonization of Oceania as a whole. Oceania is just one of those places that wasn't terribly interesting to the Europeans prior to the moment in which they decided that the entire planet had to be colonized. Uh, so until the late 1700s, there was no colonization at all. Of course, it starts with uh, Australia and then it gradually moves outward from there. Uh, and so by the late 1800s, all of those little tiny islands, everybody wanted a piece of them. Not because they, you know, had a massive amount of raw materials, although some of the islands had like rubber, which was pretty valuable. Uh, but you had religious goals for sure. You know, you wanted conversion. Another place where we got involved in imperialism was Hawaii. Uh, you know, Hawaii had been an, an, an independent nation and pretty substantial civilization for, you know, hundreds of years. But we colonized them in 1893, and we go in there and we start, you know, building huge plantations. And eventually the plantation owners get political control, and they overthrew the queen of Hawaii. And because of their economic power, they were able to convince the United States government to just straight out annex Hawaii as a whole, which they then did so in 1900. And so by 1900, every Pacific Highland was held by either Britain, France, Germany, or the United States of America, because uh, you know Spain still held on to a couple of islands in the Pacific, even after the Spanish-American War when we took Guam and the Philippines. Uh, but they just straight out sold their islands to Germany in 1899. Uh, so, you know, they're not an imperial power at all by that point. Congratulations on making it all the way to the end of a very long lecture. I really appreciate you staying for the whole thing. Uh, and feel free to watch any other video on my channel.